Alors, euh, vous l'avez entendu euh, dans la bouche euh, de, de la ministre, vous l'avez entendu aussi euh, dans le, les propos de Norbert Ifra, ces rencontres sont placées sous euh, un horizon européen qui est celui de la présidence française de l'Union, mais qui est aussi, on le verra tout au long de ces deux journées, celui de défis qui appellent de plus en plus à des synergies, à des réponses communes. Ce sont euh, les défis euh, d'une médecine de précision euh, avec euh, des recherches multicentriques de plus en plus en plus nombreux. Ce sont les défis, on le verra, de la présentation qui mobilisent des acteurs de plus en plus nombreux, de plus en plus divers. C'est aussi les défis de la vie avec et après le cancer qui appellent à de plus en plus d'accompagnement, de plus en plus de coordination. Euh, la, la dimension communautaire sur ces différents aspects, on va le voir tout au long de ces deux jours, devient un levier nécessaire, devient un levier incontournable. Et la mise en œuvre de ce plan européen sans précédent et la, et le, la création de cette mission cancer centrée sur, de, sur des axes de recherche innovants en sont évidemment une opportunité à la fois pour identifier justement les sujets autour desquels cette, cet agir ensemble, cette mobilisation commune peut se faire et puis aussi pour trouver les bonnes synergies avec les euh, initiatives et les plans nationaux. On va voir ça tout au long de ces deux journées. Euh, Norbert Ifra a présenté euh, euh, le, le programme. En, en, en deux mots, euh, on va avoir aujourd'hui une première séquence de masterclass avec les parties prenantes. Vous allez voir sur scène des chercheurs, vous allez voir sur scène des médecins, vous allez voir sur scène des représentants d'associations, vous allez voir sur scène des politiques également, qui vont être présents pour porter chacun d'eux un sujet fort sur lequel il est nécessaire, il est urgent d'agir ensemble. Euh, et j'insiste sur le fait que ces masterclass, aussi bien vis-à-vis -vis de notre auditoire connecté que vous présents dans la salle, sont des lieux évidemment de, de, de présentation, mais beaucoup de discussions. Donc on aura vraiment dans chacun d'entre eux la possibilité de recueillir vos témoignages, de recueillir, recueillir vos commentaires et d'en faire véritablement des, des, des cadres d'échange. Euh, donc n'hésitez pas dans ces moments-là à être présent et à interpeller les, les, les différents euh, représentants. Euh, nous aurons demain la restitution des, des, des ateliers d'experts réunis autour des cinq thématiques clés qui proposeront là aussi des actions novatrices pour agir de manière là aussi concertée à l'échelle européenne. Et puis ces deux tables rondes qui finiront pour euh, voir avec ceux qui à la Commission, avec ceux qui dans les pays euh, euh, membres du trio porteront l'action, euh, ceux qui construiront les synergies nécessaires dans les 18 prochains mois, quels champs d'action sont possibles et quelles perspectives s'ouvrent. Euh, L'ensemble de ces séquences, je l'ai dit, aujourd'hui et demain se font avec vous, auditoire connecté et auditoire présent ici, et on vous en remercie encore une fois. Donc n'hésitez pas à intervenir tout du long euh, de, ces, euh, de ces deux journées et d'être euh, vraiment, vous nourrirez euh, les échanges, vous nourrirez les propos et les propositions. Euh, on va tout de suite débuter. Avant, je voudrais juste euh, excuser les membres des ateliers qui se tiennent en parallèle, parce que je crois qu'il y a des ateliers qui se tiennent à partir de 11 heures. Donc s'il y a des gens qui doivent rejoindre cet atelier de 11 heures, ben, vous pouvez y aller euh, maintenant euh, et vous pourrez revenir euh, tout à l'heure par la suite parce que donc il y a les dernières sessions des ateliers qui se tiennent en parallèle. Donc voilà, si, si, si c'est le cas, vous pouvez nous, nous, nous quitter avant qu'on entame notre première masterclass du jour. Euh, on va débuter du coup ces, ces masterclass avec... Euh, un premier sujet, sujet d'importance sur lequel l'action concertée à échelle européenne est essentielle, il s'agit de, de l'innovation thérapeutique. Alors les traitements en matière de cancer sont toujours plus nombreux sur le marché, ils sont toujours plus innovants, mais euh, plus nombreux, plus innovants et pas toujours euh, accessibles pour, des, pour les patients dans les différents pays de l'Union. Alors comment penser autrement cette innovation thérapeutique pour la rendre plus efficace et pour la rendre plus accessible C'est le maître mot de le le l'EORTC, euh, l'Organisation Européenne pour la Recherche et le Traitement du Cancer. C'est une ONG qui vient de fêter cette année ses 60 ans, euh, qui réunit parmi les, les meilleurs chercheurs en matière de, de cancérologie en Europe et qui conduit des essais cliniques visant notamment à travailler à l'optimisation des traitements existants. En, en 2020, c'est important de le dire, c'est 45 essais cliniques qui ont été portés par cette structure-là, dont 60% concernent l'optimisation de traitements existants. Alors, comment généraliser cette optimisation des traitements Comment la porter par une recherche indépendante On va en parler avec notre premier invité, c'est le directeur général de cette, association, de cette structure. Denis Lacombe est avec nous
Bonjour Denis Lacombe. Uh, we're going to make this session, this session in English. So some session will be in English, some will be in French. You have your translation uh, disposal with you, so you can just switch uh, with the language if needed. Uh, I would like to start this masterclass with the first really quite simple question, actually. Uh, um, there's oncology is a field where there are a lot of treatment co coming, a lot of innovation. It's booming, it's boosting uh, all over. Um, new approaches, new therapy. Why is there such a, a necessity goal for you to uh, optimize the existing treatment as there are so many new ones coming? Well, thank you. First, uh, really a pleasure to be uh, to be here uh, this morning uh, with you. Uh, so, yeah, it's of course the the challenge statement of the of, of the topic. Sorry, I think I have to go back one. I'm not sure how to go back. Can can we go back to the previous slide? Well, so yes. it's, it's there. It's there. Well, so no, I, I think what is uh, what is important to state is that when technologies, when drugs are here, and of course we must give rapid access to innovation, there are a number of questions which remain, and which are not necessarily, of course, in the remit of the commercial sector. First of all, it's about drugs, but it's also about other technologies, radiation oncology, surgery, and this is all what we have to understand to bring optimally all this therapeutic strategy uh, to, uh, to patient. And I think there are a number of questions which actually are de-escalation studies, huh? and I will, we will show some, uh, some examples uh, about combinations, about optimal dose, about optimal, uh, about optimal scheduling, but also specific populations like rare cancers, like elderly patients. So all this feed an important agenda of clinical research, which is typically carried by the, in the, by the independent sector. And I believe that um, these data sets are very important, hopefully, for patients, uh, because uh, also what we aim to do in this agenda is to have uh, what we call clinically relevant endpoints that are extremely important for the doctors, but hopefully for the patients. And I think also that these data sets, which actually should be readily available to the community, to the patient, but also to the healthcare system, actually, to give this optimal access. And I think this should come, must come in complement to what, of course, the commercial sector is doing, bringing innovation. But then how do we recognize, how do we co confirm innovation, and how do we give, uh, do, do we give, uh, do we give access, access to it? Yeah, and you have in your organization scientific committees, uh, different ones, more than a dozen, actually, and they try to view what optimization could be done on this, on these treatments. Uh, can, you, can you give us an example? Yeah, so I've selected, of course, a very arbitrary, arbitrarily an example, and the idea is not, of course, to get into the details, and we have many of these examples, but here you will see an example that is currently in discussion at the URTC, and I will show later on examples which are not URTC, because the importance is to maintain independent clinical research in Europe, but here typically a question about uh, immuno-oncology, and how can we identify the optimal patient population we should not receive where we should uh, where we should actually uh, potentially decrease the decrease the decrease the treatment then toxicity potentially having an impact on public on public health and of course what is important for us as an organization as a patient centric organization historically you said for 60 years Patient is the center, of course, that's what we are doing. Uh, it's typically an agenda of investigator-initiated trial. But I think we have to go a step further in the current environment, we will, we will come back to that, is that if we can optimize treatment, it may have an impact on public health and on healthcare system. And what we have tried to do, and of course, it needs, of course, full research on health economics, is what could be the, the, the actually, uh, what we can not spend or where we can actually save, uh, not only first save toxicity for patients, but of course, uh, can we save uh, substantial uh, uh, monies that could be reinvested, actually maybe to finance an independent agenda at the level of the, uh, at the European level. Uh, can, can you just tell us a little bit this, this example, actually? Yes, yeah, so, well, it's typically, a, so it's typically a question where we are looking at uh, early uh, breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, and around surgery, I selected this example because, again, it's multidisciplinary, it's around, it's around, it's around surgery, where, where actually we are trying to, uh, we would be trying to understand actually how we can spare 
uh, the fact to give immuno uh, immuno-oncology and uh, ha having a shorter, a, shorter, a shorter duration. With potentially, of course, it's a, uh, a rough analysis if you look at the cost of, uh, of this treatment, what could, be, uh, what, could be the sa what could be the savings, of course. It's less toxicity, it's savings also, uh, yeah. and we see that there's, it's an economic uh, also uh, agenda and goal issue uh, ongoing. Uh, this is going for treatments. Is it also going for disposals, actually, and do you have examples for that? Yeah. So for this, I would like to take uh, something that is, has been published actually uh, last year, which I found very interesting. Huh? Uh, it's really the fact that uh, in that in, in that case, well, the, the community switched to uh, I, would, I would say minimally invasive surgery as open to uh, open surgery for cervix cancer, so using new te new technology, robot laparoscopy, uh, and actually uh, a little bit spontaneously because it's new technology. We all believe it's better until somebody, and we have seen these cases of what I call medical reversal, eh, where we believe something but we have to reverse, where one day somebody, maybe a little bit more daring than the others, says I'm going to do a clinical trial and I'm going really to, com to compare that. And when you realize that actually what you've been doing did not good to patients, on the, con on the contrary, you have to go. You have to. Go, you, you have to. You have to go back. And uh, actually, it's a beautiful series of publication. And uh, last year, uh, there was uh, this publication that looked two years after the, the communication of the clinical trial, um, how it impacted on the healthcare system. And how actually, the, the, the well, basically, the community switched back. And you see, it takes time to switch back. We have to be extremely cautious of what we are doing, what we are claiming. Again, innovation, yes, but let's make sure that we have an appropriate agenda so that we can actually confirm what we are doing. Um, the, are, are there some examples that might um, also concern um, other fields like uh, radi radiology? Yes, well, for instance, we are, uh, we are asking, I guess we should be asking as a community the same type of question about uh, proton, pro, proton therapy, for instance. Um, of course, it's completely different. The challenges are completely different than for uh, medicines because you have the facility, they are built, they cost expensive. So we are already in the real life, if I can say so. And then you have to demonstrate uh, that, that it works. And of course, uh, there are other challenges into that because when the facilities are there, of course, you need to, to exploit them. But I think we should have the intellectual honesty as a community to deliver that are very important for the patients and for, uh, uh, and for the community. Yeah, the, 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 the big thing is like really crossing the evolution of the uh, therapeutic strategies and uh, treatment innovation so that it can really match at the best, exactly. actually. Uh, this need, uh, this, the, the main point about this is improving the clinical trials. This is, this is where it, it, it all goes, actually, clinical studies, m mostly. Uh, what type of data are missing? What type of data have to be added in this yeah. clinical study? I believe, and I guess many uh, like me believe, that the future is combinatorial. So, as you can see, it doesn't belong to an organization or to a company or to a specific, to a specific drug. I think we have a lot of uh, technologies, a lot of, uh, a lot of solutions around us. And I think, again, where we can help the patient most is early stage, early stage disease, where we can apply radiation oncology, where we can apply surgery, where we can apply a number of new, techn of new technologies. And I think this is where we can help best at, at this point in time. So I think what we have to do is to develop the means, especially at the European level, how we are going to address this very efficiently. And that's where I believe Europe is uniquely placed to try to make this, to make this happen. Of course, the, the other challenge is, is that we are facing completely new data sets and multi-dimensional multi data set, especially if you go into the multidisciplinarity. And uh, actually, these are complex trials, I would say. They are much more complex research agenda than, if I can say so, just addressing a single technology. So the question indeed is, how do we make this happen? How do we actually get, uh, authorize the, all, these, uh, all these technology in combination? and actually how we are going to give access, because at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for that. 
uh, again and again, uh, the economic dimension, as I tried to, to demonstrate on the previous example, is very, is, I believe, is very important, and we have to dig a little bit further, of course, in that. Uh, th th there surely is an economical um, issue on that, and uh, we, we might come back to it afterwards. Yet there is another big issue, is that if we have more clinical studies, if we have more clinical data, it means that we have more time to uh, do these studies, to, to collect these data. It makes the, the, the whole process longer more complex actually and we're in a kind of a, of a rush uh, or at least a run to uh, get early access to the new medicine coming to the new screening disposal coming people want them uh, uh, as soon as possible it's it's a gain change gain of chance uh, issue it's very important if we have to have some so many more data so many more studies isn't it going to be like uh, or really a prob be a problem to early access to all these new innovations. No, I think the, the challenges are uh, important indeed. Again, the question is not to delay access to innovation. Of course, we must uh, we must give access, but we have to recognize that uh, I, be I believe in this relatively challenging continuum from drug development, so from clinical science, uh, from uh, going into regulatory science to, to recognize uh, and approve. I think there is a big gap, a pragmatic gap about uh, all, these, uh, all, the, all these questions. We have many challenges around us, but we have also many solutions. Uh, we are in the era of data science, we see artificial intelligence coming, we have new mechanisms to do uh, um, to do uh, clinical research, clinical trials, new form of clinical trials. And I think we have to put all this into context and see actually how we can take this up. But it's a gap that is there and that we cannot, that we cannot ignore and uh, where we are all challenging with. And um, to some extent, but I'm not an expert, I believe that uh, if we can make optimal access to all patients in Europe, it's one of the routes to address inequalities because these treatments often are expensive and if we can use them actually in a better, uh, in a better way, sometimes de-escalation, maybe there are possibilities for, for greater access. But yet we have to have early access uh, even though the, the study is not completed, but then having a kind of an optimization agenda within. Yeah. Well, the studies would be completed for what they are meant for means recognizing that a new technology works, but then the next question is how do you integrate this, uh, new, te this new technology optimally, again, in, uh, uh, I would say, multidisciplinary uh, scientific and clinical agenda. Uh, you, you, you add, and this is mainly the starting point of this masterclass, two years ago, uh, published a manifest text, uh, which is a, an alert, and also a claim to have uh, more uh, studies and more independent studies on this optimization treatment issues, uh, and that there is a problem for you, for a structure like you, 60 years old yet, but still it's difficult for you nowadays to run uh, these studies, to get access to the medicines, and you, you really had this political statement of we need to change uh, why is it necessary to change the gap, the, the game, and why is it getting difficult for you to run as as much uh, research on optimization as needed and as as needed on the on the market? Yeah. So I think I would like to show another another example, which actually uh, I could not resist because we are in France today, and this is uh, an example of a trial that is going to to be run in France. So I thank Benjamin Bess for giving me the, the opportunity to use this example also, where basically here we are uh, in the uh, in the early stage of non-small cell lung cancer, and basically this trial is going also, as you can see, to address a de-escalation de de question. So how can we give less to patients with, of course, again, toxicity, public, uh, um, quality of life, and potentially a lot, uh, a, lot of, a lot of saving. I think today, in current environment, and I come from days where uh, at the URTC 20 years ago, we used to activate extremely rapidly this type of trials based on 
all chemotherapy. I can remember cisplatin post-op in the head and neck in head and neck cancer, which was a game changer actually. And uh, today, the difficulty to do these uh, these trials at the at the, at the at the European level. And I think if I can try to have the next one to illustrate. Sorry. So here you have the data. Well, so I think uh, to get really into uh, into your question. How do we make that happen at, uh, in Europe? And we have reached a point where I believe we have to re-engineer what we are doing. We are the classical approach of drug development into into healthcare system. Um, I think we should have a better balance with what can be done, of course, uh, supported by the commercial sector, which which is of course a very important player in the field. What is of course uh, supported by you by the by, or by the uh, in the in the countries but i think there is a big agenda of course uh, of the what ngos like urtc and others are doing in this field and i think we should find solution how we can restructure all that hopefully to have the capacity to have these trials uh, rapidly done at the european level not necessarily single country is potentially changing practice and that everybody would have access in Europe to the, to the data set to take into account of course the principle of subsidiarity but at least the data set is there for, for, for everyone. Um, so need, need to have this I would say protected and dynamic frame for independent research yeah. on this uh, treatment op optimization. Um, one question is we're going to speak the whole day today and tomorrow about this really tremendous time with the european plan with the cancer mission on coming there is also a new regulation on pharmaceutical that is coming also in europe uh, how this question is inside all these uh, different actions is it is it is it addressed by the plan by the mission by the regulation or not sufficiently for you and just what can you just put the mic more close, close to, to the, the yes um, no i think uh, we, are, uh, we are very lucky we have a unique uh, unique opportunities today in cancer and i think all the actors that have been uh, uh, i would say instrumental in uh, in putting all these european agendas uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that the concept of treatment optimization and what we should be doing uh, is not completely addressed. Maybe because, and uh, uh, actually, in the post-marketing area, huh, once you, we are no longer addressing a European competence, but we are in the healthcare systems. So, of course, we are in the countries, and the difficulty for us to uh, actually to find our way. Uh, has been to um, uh, indeed address an, an agenda that is not necessarily completely a European, uh, uh, a Euro a European agenda. And uh, that's where we fall with some, uh, some difficulty. I think there are also hope with, uh, for instance, uh, the, like the UNETA, the, Europe, the European network of, uh, of HTA bodies. I think this gives also opportunities to see how we can address that with the, with the country and these new mechanisms. These new, uh, and these new what would you what would you like actually would you like fundings would you like you, you told me when we prepared that the, a nice way of saying uh, we need a place to meet which is yes. simple but means a lot what would you like what could it be actually yeah so yes we first we need a play before money and of course we need money to do to this uh, such an agenda but i think we need to first think about the process. And again, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. I think we have to re-engineer. To re and I think what we need is a place where in the vicinity of marketing authorization, we could identify, and usually we know them, what are the three, four, five questions that are really needed for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for access. So that actually this agenda, this independent agenda, I insist on this independent agenda, could be happening to inform the, the patients, the doctor and the healthcare system. And that's what we are, uh, that's what we are missing. 
Uh, and actually, we have had, of course, a lot of discussion with many of the, uh, the stakeholders. And I am pleased today because it was announced by Emer Cook, the executive director of the EMA, uh, last year in November at the European Cancer uh, Organization uh, uh, Policy Summit, that uh, we have a partnership with the EMA. So the EMA has created now the Cancer Medicine Forum. It's going to be launched this year. That and we see on the slide. Sorry. The, the one we see on the, the slide. One, the one that we see on the slide, indeed. Uh, and really, we have convinced, I hope, and the regulator that, uh, of course, all giving access is very important, but what is next? And uh, again, where do we address? Where is the place to meet? And here, we are, be we are being given a place for academics to liaise with the regulator to address these questions, but first, to address what could be the mechanisms to position this question and see from there how, how we can progress. So it's really, I believe, a first step on how the work done by independent organizations and their data sets can actually inform and be structured, and that would be my wish, that the data sets that are produced are being actually structured into this, into this process and serve society. Uh, two last questions because before we get the, the questions from the audience and if you are connected also you can have your questions and comments and I will uh, also uh, of course speak them to, to, the, to Denis. Um, one is that you want a structure that uh, I mean gather the actors to find a new organization. This means you're going to have researchers, you're going to have academics and you have, you're going to have the, the industry also uh, on, the, on the shame. Uh, how the consensus uh, might happen, and particularly in, in specificity with the, the industry, actually, because mm -hmm. your uh, big either means uh, uh, more money and more regulation for them, so that they might be a bit reluctant to it, I guess. Well, the regulations apply to everyone. They apply to the ORTC when we do our clinical trial in the same way they apply to industry, so there is hopefully no difference, not to tier the research. In, uh, in, in Europe, um, and I believe, well, industry, like the other stakeholders, including organizations like us, we have to leave our, con our comfort zone. We have to do things, uh, things differently. And here, a little bit what I try to, to address is that, uh, coming back a little bit to this gap between Europe and the countries, uh, something that could be extremely important do we address actually between countries this agenda? How are, we, how are we going to make it happen? Where is the place to discuss? Where can we coordinate, for instance, cancer plans around uh, this type of question? So that uh, actually uh, the, these, uh, these programs, again, if they are endorsed, if they are, uh, if they are approved, they can be efficiently done. So that indeed the trials that I've tried to, to show you this morning could be rapidly, uh, ra rapidly activated. I want to believe that uh, these trials are very important. They are designed by the investigators in the field. These represent questions that they have and they need this information. So uh, we have to rethink putting really, and it was said in the introduction, science at the center. And uh, of course, uh, how do we bring this science to the patients in an optimal, in an optimal, in an optimal manner? Last, last question is, is about maybe a, a, I would say connect, uh, connected uh, uh, subject from what you said, but important because more and more of these studies are then we're going to see it today with real life data, of course, and the collection, the use of all a lot of questions also in, 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 the, in the clinical studies. Is it an issue that you can address through such a place to meet, through such a, an independent research? Yeah. And how, what could be done about it? Yeah. So I, I think, uh, again, real-world data is, uh, of course, is part of new, the new opportunities that we have to put uh, into, our, uh, into our think tank. I would like still to give a word of caution because, again, we are an organization Basis. So we have access to a lot of data, so real-world data needs to be approached extremely cautiously. We certainly need to have uh, to develop research on research, if I can say so, research on research methodology, so that... What do you call research on research? It means, it means understanding
spending? Uh, well, it's like everything. If you need to develop new approaches, you have to validate them. And that's what I call research on research uh, sol uh, solution. That's very, that's very important. The first thing. Second thing, um, there is real world data and there is real world data. If you collect real world data in an observatory manner, an observational manner, just because you want to see if uh, in the real life there is more toxicity or less, it's completely different that if you want to take a decision for treatment where you need to assess causality between the treatment and actually the outcome of the patient. And the challenge in using real world data is therefore completely, completely different. I think that's important. Having said that, indeed, big opportunities, and I think that some of the trials I've been showing you could be done in the real life because they are standard treatment. We are just asking an optimization question. They could be extremely simple. And randomizing patients in real life based on standard treatment would be bringing robustness to, to, this, uh, to this real world data. And I think it's feasible, eh? you know, we are all randomized every day by Google and so on for a number of questions and we don't, e and we don't even know. So randomizing in real life, bringing robustness to the healthcare system and to the patient, I believe is something we should investigate. Uh, questions. The Jeremy is an uh, ambitious uh, masterclass uh, issue. Uh, do, do we have some questions in the audience here? I have some questions from the connected audience. Um, if, if you have, you just raise your head, like, uh, and, and the mic is going to come to you. M maybe before, just I, I take one question. Uh, uh, da -da, uh, um, you do not include public health in your scheme. Don't you think that population-based and contextualized approach should be better registered in the fight against cancer? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think I'm, if it's about public health, I mentioned that actually this research are public health research or questions. These are really the type of questions we need to, uh, uh, to, to answer. And usually I, I, I refer to treatment optimization, applied clinical research, or public health research. It's really, at the, I believe, at the core of... Uh, of, of public health and application and application uh, uh, in real life, I believe. Maybe uh, there are experts in epidemiology in real life, which I am not, that can also contribute. Uh, do, do, are there some questions in the, in the audience or comments can be also, uh, of course, and uh, don't hesitate, this, this masterclass are for you and, and uh, also don't hesitate to comment, yes. There's only one. If you can just present yourself before, yeah, thanks. Uh, we don't hear you, but I think it's going to be. I have to push something, huh? Yeah, it yes, works. Now you hear me, so thank you, thank you, Denis. Uh, very nice presentation, Pierre de Molis from the French Medicines Agency, and uh, a member of the European Network. Uh, I believe that you pointed something which is very important. What is the best use we can have for a drug once it is on the market? And here, we are tempted to use the real-world data, yes. Uh, the, the, this is a, an evolving field. My fear is that what do we lack? Much of these real-world data settings are organized by uh, the industry. And th this is a good thing because we can learn much from this data. The problem is that some questions are not questions that please the industry. You gave us a very good example we should not apply a treatment to every patient, despite this treatment getting a marketing authorization for a large indication. And there, the question is a question which is directed to a, a, a loss of profit. And uh, the interest is for the patients and for, 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 for the countries and for the system. So I, I believe it's very important that the, 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 the public force gives money, work, work staff, uh, anything, to people that would address the questions that are not necessarily the questions coming from industry. And this will be something that will profit the, 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 the money for the states and for the system, but the patients as well, because it could be a good solution not to expose patients to useless treatments. So I, I really welcome the dialogue to organize with DMA 
And uh, there is something we could do with the HTAs, the, the, the payers at the, at the level of the European states. And I believe that initiative is very important, very important, and thanks a lot for, for, for your talk. No, if I can, thank you for your comment, and uh, I just would like to, uh, to, to give an additional information that, well, personally, I've been in the field of cancer clinical research, research for 30 years, and what um, indeed I see over the decades is that in Europe, there is a greater imbalance between commercial research and non-commercial research. And I think this is something we have, to, we, have to, we have to address. It's much more difficult, and the gap is actually incre increasing, and that's what we want, uh, we want to alert. It's not necessarily the case uh, in North America, where they have other mechanisms. And I think, again, these trials that uh, come from the, from the field, from the doctors, to, answer the, to really bring therapeutic uh, progress to, to their patients, and we have to put back in the center. And as all the stakeholders, we will have to, again, leave our comfort zone, readdress, but I believe that if it's in the interest of the patients, it's in the interest of everyone, because everyone can be a patient at any point in time. There's a, a question from the uh, connected audience, which is a bit related to that one, is isn't the real world uh, approach uh, the, uh, the great opportunity, a great opportunity to use uh, IA uh, to uh, see which patient or tumor uh, data determines results. Well, it's possibly one of the routes. Eh? We have to, that's, res that's typically research on research, validate artificial intelligence, how it can help us. I believe it will not be done overnight. Again, if you have to assess causality, you need a lot of certainty in what you are saying what you, and, and what you are claiming. And here there are challenges that we have to address that are for statisticians, for bioinformaticians, and, 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 doctors, and doctors together. So yes, potentially, but not today. Certainly not today. There's maybe an extra question for me and maybe for, from the audience is, you, you, in that place to meet, what shall be the place for the patients? Because more and more associations of patients are also uh, having some questions on the clinical studies because of they want to have an integration of the quality of life yeah. uh, issues and data more uh, concretely in, in the time of the cl yeah. clinical studies. No, I think the patients, of course, are central because at the end of the day, we are doing that for them. And uh, at the URTC, we have a patient panel and all our activities actually are channeled through the patient panel. So these are discussions we discuss with them. Uh, and um, of course, that's, uh, that's very important that they are actually at the table to discuss all that. Uh, questions, yes. Uh, if the, the Especially when it comes to endpoint like quality of life. Uh, uh, the, uh, is it possible to have a micro for Mr. Ifra? Merci. Merci beaucoup, Denis, de, de cette présentation. Ce sera plutôt un, un, un commentaire que, uh, que des questions. Euh, le commentaire, c'est que effectivement, l'aide de la puissance publique sur tout ce qui est euh, travaux d'optimisation des indications et euh, des croissances de la, de, des doses, par exemple, euh, qui est essentiel, je crois, pour l'optimisation pour des traitements, cette aide est indispensable. Et, et, et c'est vraiment notre rôle commun d'essayer d'organiser ça. Je suis complètement d'accord avec toi. On ne peut pas attendre ça, évidemment de demande de l'industrie. C'est un besoin de sécurité pour les malades. C'est aussi, même si ça n'est pas accessoire, ça vient en second, un besoin d'avoir la meilleure dépense possible et la plus juste pour nos sociétés. Et donc ça, il faut qu'ensemble, nous travaillions à ce que, au niveau européen, il y ait cette réflexion. Je rejoins tout à fait ce qu'a dit, euh, ce qu dit euh, Pierre, euh, Pierre de Molis. Hein. C'est évidemment notre rôle et notre mission commune. Alors, ça suppose aussi que, je crois, au niveau des, des appels d'offres euh, nationaux, pour chacun d'entre nous, il y ait euh, une place qui soit réservée à des essais de ce type, euh, qui soient européens, euh, et, et dont on sait que parce qu'il n'y aura aucun soutien de l'industrie, notamment, euh, il y aura une, une, un budget, je dirais, par essai qui est supérieur à celui qu'on a l'habitude de voir dans des essais, évidemment, partiellement soutenus. Donc il faut vraiment qu'on change le prisme de lecture 
au moment de l'évaluation de ces, de ces essais pour permettre à des organisations indépendantes hein, comme, comme la vôtre et comme, et, et comme il y en a d'autres de, de faire ce travail que personne d'autre ne fera sans. Et ça m'amène à dire une deuxième chose, c'est qu'il faut qu'on réfléchisse aussi ensemble euh, entre guillemets au cahier de remplissage des observations parce que euh, petit à petit euh, du fait des exigences euh, qu'il y a eu pour l'enregistrement des médicaments, on est arrivé à des cahiers euh, qui, sont, qui font penser, tu sais, euh, euh, aux, aux, tar, enfin, aux femmes savantes et hors un gros plus tard qu'à mettre mes rabats, il faudrait jeter tout ce meuble inutile et laisser la science au docteur de la ville. C'est exactement ça. C'est-à-dire qu'on a des documents monstrueux et dont personne ne sait se servir et dont personne n'a l'usage. Et je crois que si on revient, si on revient à de quoi avons-nous besoin puisque ce médicament est enregistré, pour savoir à quelle maladie il est utile, dans quelles conditions, alors on redonne une chance à la recherche académique, tout simplement parce que les exigences de cahiers aussi énormes font qu'évidemment le médecin ne peut plus le remplir, on, on génère... Une, euh, un, un travail de technicien de recherche clinique de, qui permettent de remplir ces cahiers de façon considérable et quelle que soit la qualité des techniciens de recherche clinique de plus en plus ça s'éloigne du médecin qui a soigné euh, le malade et qui a regardé les choses donc là on a un vrai travail commun à faire je crois pour euh, rendre sa chance à la recherche académique et je pense que c'est l'Europe le bon niveau pour, pour répondre à ça. Donc là, il faut vraiment qu'on y travaille ensemble. Pour, pour compléter peut-être, parce que c'est une remarque qui, est, qui vient du, du, du public connecté euh, en anglais, « Facilitating uh, academic development also means reviewing the regulatory process. Currently, this process to get, uh, uh, to get a marketing authorization is not adapted to non-industrial uh, players. » C'est ce qui va dans le sens exactement de ce que vous venez de dire. Je, je voudrais juste, il y a une autre question. Uh, um, can you comment on this issue that many countries have? Uh, they get access to new drugs during their studies and after there is a long gap before even uh, life-saving drugs are made available while, while they were for uh, the study time. Right. That's aside from what we are discussing today, mm -hmm. I cannot answer why, because it's not in my competence, it's in the fact of access by the well, industry and the regulator and HTA bodies, but what I believe is that if the data sets are not there, how can people give access? So that's for me important, so maybe, maybe, but that's an hypothesis that we should verify if these data sets actually can uh, facilitate rapid access because we would have more information about these drugs, technologies. Again, I don't want to limit to drugs, it's multidisciplinarity. And, uh, potentially, we can optimize more rapid access if we have the data, if we have the data set. I must admit that sometimes, if I would be a body that has to decide to give access to my citizen, when I see some of the data sets, I believe I would have a lot of difficulty. Uh, thank you a lot, Daniel Akam, for this first masterclass. It can be applause. <laughs>